So you remember how they said that the the Ukraine war was going to be bad for Russia and we put economic sanctions on Russia and what it actually did was get Russia to move closer to China, which was something that everybody has warned about for decades from Henry Kissinger to Noam Chomsky has warned us doing that. And they said that's the kind of crazy stuff that Trump was going to do. But that's exactly the kind of stuff the neocon warmongers that uh, Joe Biden works for do and Joe Biden's administration is doing. So now the worst of all outcomes, we spent hundreds of billions of dollars on a proxy war with Russia and it's only strengthened them. The, uh, the ruble is now stronger than it was before the war. Their economy's booming. Uh, and now Saudi Arabia is selling oil and other denominations besides the U.S. greenback which is horrible for our economy. It's called the petrodollar. I don't have time to explain it now. I've explained it a million other times, but that's what backs up. That's why we can keep print money printing is because of the petrodollar mm -hmm. and guys like Joe Biden and his administration are now making that go away because of stuff like this. And turns out that the, this is from the, even the Financial Times has to admit now that the surprising resilience of the Russian economy. Addressing a crowd of activists on Friday in Tula, the capital of Russia's arms industry, Vladimir Putin crowed that the country's econo economy had defeated Western sanctions imposed after his invasion of Ukraine, and they sanctioned the hell out of them. The, the predicted decline, failure, collapse that we would stand back, give up, or fall apart, it makes you want to show them a well-known gesture. But I won't do that. He meant this. There are a lot of ladies here, Putin said to a round of applause. They won't succeed. Our economy is growing unlike theirs. Russia, right. The, so when they blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, the United States did that, NATO. That was bad for Russia, but worse for Europe. Way worse for Europe and Germany specifically. And now Germany's spending two, three, four times the amount they used to spend for energy than they were before the United States. And so, and why did those countries go along with it? Because we have a thousand military bases around the world. That's why. Russia's president gloated that Russia's economy had not only withstood an onslaught of sanctions from Western countries, but was now bigger than all but two of them. He was referring to the World Bank's ranking of GDP by purchasing power parity, by which Russia slightly edges ahead of Germany. All of our industry did their part. On Tuesday, the IMF appeared to concur with Russia's president. The IMF revised its own GDP growth for, forecast for Russia to 2.6% this year. That's a 1.5 percentage point rise over what it had predicted just last October. Russia grew faster than all the G7 economies last year, and the IMF forecast it'll do it again. There's Russia. Look at, here's Russia up here. Here's the, here's the U.S. Here's the rest of the G7 countries. Wow. The Russian economy's resilience has stunned many economists who had believed the initial round of sanctions over the invasion of Ukraine nearly two years ago could cause a catastrophic contraction for Russia. Didn't do it. Instead, they say the Kremlin has spent its way out of a recession by evading Western attempts to limit its revenues from energy sales and by ramping up defense spending. Putin's own top economic officials have warned a surge in public spending comes at the risk of... Oh, so here's where the Financial Times does the, uh, the pro-war propaganda that the West wants them to do. Oh, because it's a risk that Russia's, over, Russia's overspending? Not the United <laughs> States. The United States, $36 trillion in debt. And they won't spend a penny on our own country. But they will spend it for bomb to bomb other countries. That's not bad. But what Russia's doing, okay. But for the time being, it's keeping growth robust, what their spending is. All of this would have been impossible if Russia had not continued to generate colossal revenue from its energy resources, despite our sanctions. The regime is resilient because it sits on an oil rig, says Alina Rybokova, a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. The Russian economy now is like a gas station that has started producing tanks. The Kremlin shift to what Vasily Astrov, a senior economist at the Vienna Institute, calls military Kenyanism. Okay, we all know what Kenyan... Kenyan economics is. That's another word for it. It's a radical break from the conservative <laughs> macroeconomic policy of Putin's first two decades in power. 
The, that approach has also proved crucial in mitigating the initial impact of the sanctions at the war's outset, when Western countries froze $300 billion of Russia's sovereign reserves and the Kremlin imposed currency controls to halt an exodus of capital and a run on their banks. Here's what uh, Arnaud Bertrand says, the Financial Times finally admitting that economic sanctions on Russia have been a complete failure which was immensely predictable. In fact, I wrote a, an article saying it would be the case in May of 2022, right when the war started. It is without a doubt one of the most significant economic stories of the century, starkly demonstrating the West's diminishing power. Despite Bruno Le Maire, France's minister of the economy, claiming the West would cause the collapse of the Russian economy, Russia's economic growth in 2023 three surpassed all of the G7 countries, almost quadrupling France's growth rate, and is projected to continue this trend in 2024. It's nothing short of extraordinary. So here's a graph. And uh, as Vladimir Putin is quoted as saying in the Financial Times article, Russia's economy had not only withstood an onslaught of sanctions from Western countries, but it's now bigger than all but two of them. It is also yet another proof, if need be, of Western hubris, uh, of the West living in a glorious mental universe where they think they can bring the rest of the world's world to heal. This proves the immense tectonic size gap between what they believe and reality. It shows that whilst they think they inhabit a world in which they lead, we've in fact fully entered a multipolar era. So the United States, the hegemon, the world's imperials, is, does not control the world's economy like they think they are. And Russia could withstood their, uh, their sanctions, and they're stronger than ever. It also obviously raises the question of China, whose economy is six times the size of Russia's in PPP terms and 20% larger than that of the United States. What happened with Russia demonstrates clearly that they now command more economic power than the West. It was a form of tug of war with the West saying, we'll cause the collapse of the Russian economy and China saying, we don't want to. And the result is the Russian economy didn't collapse. It grew faster than the West and so did China's. That means something. In conclusion, yep. it is an imperative for the West to confront reality and shed its old colonialist, colonialist worldview. Time and time again now, the West emerges as the principal victim of its own delusions. Everything points to the fact that the rest of the world is more attuned to the realities in place. And when your actions are based on a humble assessment of the truth rather than on hubris, the outcome is better. It's that simple. When reality keeps punching you in the face at some point, you need to wake up. So this big idea that Joe Biden and the neocons thought that they could put sanctions on Russia, they could start a war with them, bleed them economically, blow up the Nord Stream pipeline, which would curtail their revenue coming from their gas and oil sale. All that was wrong. They were 100 percent wrong. They're idiots. The people that are running the United States, which is not Joe Biden, it's the people who control him, but it certainly is all the people who are handpicked to be in his administration by the West military industrial complex, Wall Street and oil company. They're morons and they're operating on hubris. They think that we could just bomb our way and sanction our way into economic prosperity. And what this Ukraine war is proving is the exact opposite is happening. And we're an empire in decline. It's over for the United States. We can't even take care of our own people. They have no, and they don't even care to take care of our own country. Uh, Russia has cleaner subways. They have Medicare for everybody. And they have a booming economy. Over it. Let me bring in the uh, Russell and Keaton. Well, you know, this seems like a trivial thing to say, but it's a perfect metaphor for how this all worked out. If you remember in the days following February of 2022, when this war uh, got going, you had a lot of American liquor stores take this stance we don't carry Russian uh, vodka in our store anymore. Uh, really? Yeah, we're boycotting <laughs> Russian vodka. Yeah, I didn't even say that. Here. There were a handful of them that I saw myself personally, but it was a thing. It was in the news. Yeah, uh, they they stuck to that for about 10 weeks, and then yeah. it was back on the shelves, right? And, and I feel like that's a really a metaphor for this. Um, despite what you know, Western propaganda would have you think, Putin is not a moron. He's not a madman. 
Uh, he's a much more serious leader than our leaders. Russia is a much more serious country than this country. And uh, the ruble took uh, a hit, as that article said, uh, in February 2022. But six months later, it was back higher than it was in January that year. And so um, this was very foreseeable. Why would China side with us over Russia? Why would Brazil or India side with us over Russia? Did we ever stop to ask ourselves that? No. Why? Because of our ego, our what is he? What was the word he used? Hubris. 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 Yeah, our hubris. Exactly. It's exactly right. Which, which is arrogance on on steroids. That's what hubris is. Yep. Well, well, this this was, I mean, to to some of Keaton's points, and and this is a point he's made elsewhere. Um, if you look at the leaders of these other nations, they are so much more dignified than ours. Look at look at Boris Johnson. Look at Joe Biden. <laughs> And then look at Vladimir Putin. Whatever you think of Vladimir Putin, that's a serious man. Look at look at Johnson and Biden. Do they strike you as serious <laughs> no. people by comparison? No. If you look at that Tucker Carlson interview, but again, whether you agree with Putin or not, you, you listen to his command of language, of concepts, his present. And by the way, this was the guy who was supposed to be dying, right? They told us this two years ago. He looks right. pretty fucking looks pretty on his game to me. Um, I think he's probably one of the most strategically brilliant world leaders on the stage today. And I said for, I wrote an article right after that, the Ukraine war broke out arguing that forcing a choice away from American payment systems and away from the Western uh, Bretton Woods economic arrangements that have held sway since the post-war era was part of Putin's plan. I believe that. I believe that that was part of his intention to force that kind of a choice because you already had de-dollarization in progress. You already had a lot of countries starting to reduce their dollar holdings. The stupidest, you want to talk about hubris, the stupidest thing they could have done was to weaponize the dollar's position as the global reserve currency. Because once countries saw us do that, well, now we can no longer be trusted in that position. And now you've made a world that is not very happy with us anyway, a world that no longer sees us as a country with the moral authority or the intellectual fiber to lead now you've really given them a motivation to look for alternatives and they did so they what, went over to china's unipay system away from the west's uh, swift payment system which is how they process payments through banks um as as you mentioned they they started to uh price oil outside of the dollar india which is supposed to be an ally basically told the United States to go get your fucking shine box when we told them to stop buying this Russian oil. And through the circuitous means through which oil is distributed, the biggest purchaser of Russian crude, us, the United States. In the end, the circumstances of capitalism will not even allow us to actually boycott Russian oil because we are not going to let the gas prices go to $8. That's not going to happen. So what what you're saying is that the United States, by being the world reserve currency, so every country has to have the United States dollar so they can trade. Right. Now they realize that the United States weaponized that, meaning yes. that they will now use that as blackmail. And, and and if they if they don't like what you're doing, they'll now use they'll kick you out of being able to use the dollar. They'll hold that over right. your head. And yeah. we've seen they'll we, freeze your dollars. They'll freeze your dollars. And we've seen countries in Africa talk about this. Say, why do I? What I forget what country it was, but it was like say uh, 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 Chad and uh, Zimbabwe, and they were saying, let's just I'm making this up, but they were saying, why do I have to? go get dollars, take my currency, turn it into dollars to go buy something from this country right next door to me. Why does this, that, that doesn't make any sense. So they're stopping to right. do that. And, you know, right. that's why but a big reason 
why they did Libya, one of them reasons, was because Gaddafi right. wanted to ha have a currency for Africa. So Africa wouldn't have to hold United States reserve currency dollars. And that was another reason that they wanted to get rid of him. And they did. That's why. So, again, if yeah. all the wars are bankers' wars, all the wars are for economics, all the wars are because the United States is the world's terrorist. It's not Hamas. It's not ISIS. It's not Al-Qaeda. It's not the Taliban. It's not Russia. It's not Putin. It's not China. The world's terrorists, economically and literally, is the United States and our military. And, you know, I go to these sports. I was at the Lakers game Wednesday. Boy, that was it was unbelievable. The Clippers were up 21 points in the fourth quarter, and of course they lost. You know why? Because LeBron James outscored the entire Clippers team in the fourth quarter. That's a that's a guy. That's a that's a dominant player. That's a one of the all time greats. Anyway, but they do He's this. The Putin to, of Los Angeles. He is the, the Putin, Putin of, of the <laughs> NBA. Yeah. But if you go to a Dodgers game, or you go to a Lakers game, or a Clippers game, or I'm sure if you go to a a uh, football game. They hey, please all the members of our military stand, and they, you're just. It's I, I've got no problem respecting people be, for think doing what they thought was service to their country, but service to in our military today is not service to your country. It's service to the military industrial complex, and that's just war propaganda. And I've seen uh, many comedians do jokes about when they at the football games and they fly the stealth bombers over. And what the announcer should say is all the stuff that we could have had instead of that. We could have mm -hmm. had a functioning infrastructure and we could have had libraries and we could have had health care. But instead we got that. And well, it was revealed about 10 years ago, I think, maybe even more. This is an old story. I forget exactly when it came out that the Pentagon actually had a deal with the NFL to do these very jingoistic, yes. hyper militarized right, pregame shows right. and halftime shows and things like that. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, it, um, I actually stood, uh, two games ago at the, uh, people turned around, hey, thanks for your service. I go, that, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> I, uh, no, I was actually standing up to, I was inadvert, I was unwittingly standing during that because I wasn't listening because they nod, stop, do s sound and noise at the game. And so I just block it out when they went to a commercial and I was standing up doing something and it happened to be during that time when someone turned around and I go, Hey, thanks for your service. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and then my friend with me, Alan Heavy goes, Hey, thanks for your service, Jimmy. And I was like, Oh, am I standing now? I didn't know. <laughs> hey, come see us live on tour in Los Angeles, Palm Springs, Stockholm, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Berlin, Copenhagen, Oslo, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, Cortland, New York, Oakmont, Pennsylvania, right outside Pittsburgh, El Paso, and San Antonio, Texas. Go to JimmyDoor.com for a link for all those tickets. Mm -hmm.